All right. Let me now open the Brain Seminar second edition. Thank you all very much for coming and uh, for tuning in, for those of you who are tuning in. Um, this was uh, originated last year, around this time last year, this seminar series, and uh, ran for the first time in January. And then we thought we'd run uh, uh, every several months or so um, for as long as we had an interesting program to show. Um, and then the whole world ended and uh, everything changed. And now here we all are again, except not very many of us. Uh, not exactly all, but those few brave souls of you who came in today, thank you. Um, so the brain seminars are about bringing together local work on cognitive neuroscience and uh, AI. And the idea is to show uh, where these fields overlap. There's um, definitely a, a very current um, very current vibe in both fields. Uh, definitely AI is something that um, is growing and growing and becoming more and more important. And uh, well, neuroscience is, uh, has been a growing field for quite a number of years, but um, cognitive neuroscience and uh, specifically cognitive computational neuroscience is also a field that is becoming more and more mature. So um, I wanted to get together speakers who are working on these topics. Uh, I asked them to, to describe what they're working on and then asked them to just talk to each other about that, um, about that work and where it overlaps. Uh, so today we have with us uh, five speakers. We have Professor Jörg Tiedemann uh, from the Faculty of Arts in the University of Helsinki. Um, we have Professor Rita Salmelin. Uh, from Aalto University. We have Professor Rika Motanen, who's uh, joining the University of Helsinki next year. Uh, Jami, uh, Jami Pekkinen, postdoc Jami Pekkinen at the University of Helsinki as well, and uh, Michael Lakasuo, docent Michael Lakasuo. Um, all of these speakers do very interesting work, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what, what they present. Um, but also there's, there's an interesting uh, nexus between what they do in the sense that um, the theme today is uh, somewhere around how do we establish or how do we uh, extract um, interaction with our AIs that reflects what we find meaningful in the world, what we as human beings are interested in or find meaningful or uh, can, can kind of understand as, as a meaningful interaction. Um, so as to say, uh, how do we get the AI to sort of recognize us and how do we recognize it as an other entity in the world? Um, and, and I think that although each speaker may not work directly on this topic, which is a very uh, sort of ephemeral topic, but nevertheless, they have some interesting perspective on it based on the work that they do. So without any further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce Professor Jörg Tiedemann, who will talk to us about um, machine translation and uh, how does that relate to intelligence. So welcome, Jörg. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I have to point out something um, that is showing on the left side. It's going to disappear in a moment. This is a Pressimo page. Um, if you could just switch back to the, yeah, Alt tab is the one you need. Yeah, and uh, this is a Pressimo page where you can um, enter your questions to the speakers throughout the session. And we'll try to pick up on the questions uh, after each speaker has spoken and then ask them. And then at the, at the end, when the panel discussion, you'll be able to ask as well. So I don't know if you can see that the, the font, it's very small, but um, if it hadn't have disappeared, but it's uh, <laughs> Presimo Piste Helsinki Piste Fi forward slash Kaulai, uh, C-O-W-L-A-I. So that's a portmanteau of my name, Kauli and AI, which is very clever, isn't it? <laughs> All right, go, on, go ahead, York. Okay. Thank you very much for coming here. It's good to see some people. Uh, typically, I'm sitting at home in my home office and watching the screen. Um, thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting. 
Um, so I work with language technology and, and something like a year ago I made up this very ambitious title here and then during all the time waiting for the seminar to happen, I kind of forgot what I really wanted to tell about this topic. Uh, let's see where it goes to. So I try to talk about language technology, of course, but then especially the conne connection to AI, and I had also the more, more debatable term of consciousness here in the title. Let's see how we get to that part on this, this discussion. So what I would like to talk about is how language connects to AI in general. And I have a little bit of motivation why language is really an important thing when we talk about intelligence and AI especially. And I made this just, uh, just to, to introduce you, to, to make, make you start, and I started here an example where someone would like to uh, ask a question to an AI system. So assume that you have an AI system, and, and then our prime minister is then asking whether Finland should join the NATO. Uh, a typically complex question that someone needs maybe some help to decide upon. And then we have this super complex system, AI system, that then gives us some kind of prediction. And let's assume it just says yes. Uh, so, of course, this is just to, uh, to, to illustrate that the uh, kind of AI systems that we know rely on or maybe to ask ourselves, they provide some predictions, some answers to certain questions, but, but having very complex problems, uh, when we get, get just a prediction from, from some kind of black box system, this might not need be enough uh, for us to really make some decisions and to really see the intelligence behind that system. So what I want to ask, uh, want to argue about this in this, in this talk is that uh, the importance of language uh, in intelligent system should not be underestimated. So, so if we talk about intelligence among humans and, and how we build our intelligence, how we use intelligence, uh, then this is a lot about communications, interaction. Uh, so, so as we are here now sitting here, we also use language quite a lot. Uh, so we discuss, we argue, we explain things, um, we learn by, by listening, by reading, and, and teach also by using language a lot. So, so building up intelligence and using our intelligent behavior requires interaction and communication to really acquire all kinds of complex uh, knowledge about the world around us and to make these kind of uh, complex decisions um, that we have to deal with. So something that I really want to argue here in this talk especially about is that this part of uh, explaining is something that is very much important. It's not enough to just give an answer to a complex question, like one single line, for example, but it's important to also um, provide some reasoning for, for, for argumentation, for, for having that decision made. Um, so if you see in this picture here, so I wrote that this kind of spoken, written human languages are really much important to build up intelligence among humans. So of course, then for me, the conclusion is that this should also be very much important for building uh, artificial systems that build some kind of intelligent behavior. So if you now look at uh, language and, and knowledge and how we do problem solving uh, again here, so then we can see that language is, is the tool that we are using in our daily lives and, and to do come kind of inter intelligent interaction. So one question is, of course, why do we rely so much on language? And, and the thing that I think is really the most important part of, of having language as a communication tool is that this is really so universal. It can express very complex things by doing a very efficient compression of information, thoughts, and, and, and ideas that we have into something that we can um, distribute, um, communicate to others. So the, the important part of language is that it is not just a, it, it is not a mapping, a simple mapping from some, some meaning to, to some uh, encoded um, information, but the, the way of compressing it is really important here. So uh, that we have some way of in, in, in a limited amount of time communicating very complex things, uh, where the other part, uh, understanding, so someone receiving that signal, needs to have some intelligence to actually decode this kind of lossy compressed uh, information into something back that reflects similar meaning thoughts, but you will, as this is lossy, you will never get to exactly the same point, but you have something that gives you mutual understanding and some kind of communication uh, success, but, but there's, there's always some uh, imperfect match behind that. So what I mean is here that uh, the difference to, say, let's say, artificial languages or programming languages is that ambiguity is a crucial part in languages. And, and typically, if you work with uh, technology, ambiguity and, and working with that is, is seen as a problem. But in fact, this, this part of ambiguity in languages is uh, a feature, not a bug, as I see here, uh, say it here on the slide. It is the crucial part that makes this lossy compression possible. 
Um, so if you don't have this kind of ambiguous way of compressing information, you would not be able to have really complex uh, ideas to get through. And then the interpretation part is now really important. That this, this part is really the important thing of getting back to the knowledge that you want to perceive and that you see encoded in some kind of language uh, string. As this is now optimized over all these uh, years of evolution, uh, it, it really makes us uh, uh, behave in such a way that we can really um, deal with very complex questions in, in the same way, using that tool all the time. So this is my argument for language as, as an essential thing in AI. So a bit of um, relation to what we do. So, so most of these things that I present are not very practical, but I have some parts of, of uh, talking about uh, learning to understand. But first, let's see how, how we humans might learn to understand language. And just also another example here. So if, if I would assume that uh, some, some kid would uh, try to learn some concepts, then this is, uh, if I will uh, continue argumentation about communication, very important to have interaction. So if my daughter is asking me about uh, something like a concept of gin, then this might be that I have to explain as a father in some ways what is this kind of thing that, uh, that you want to le learn about. So learning the connection between a real object and some real concept uh, by explaining it with language what it is. So explanation is very important to, to um, explain all the kind of properties that I want to uh, connect with this kind of object. It's not only the, the form and how it looks like, but there's a lot of other things that are related to it, like uh, it's something to drink and nothing for you, it's alcohol and so on. Another thing is, of course, then you live in a world, in an environment, so of course this kind of grounding here um, really, really plays a role here. So I can just show, for example, a bottle and, and point at it and at the same time also explain that this is now a bottle of gin. So here you can see some some kind of example of this concept that you want to learn. And of course, you can then make conclusions by, OK, this bottle looks like other bottles that my dad is always hiding away somewhere. So you can make some conclusions by relating it to other kinds of objects in the same way. In the same way, you can also see someone who maybe have, has been drinking too much of that substance, and you can also make some conclusions from that. So you get properties that really, um, uh, in, the, in the whole lifetime, develop the concept and your idea of understanding it. And then, of course, as you're living, you can also see that certain activities and actions will, will, will really enforce, reinforce uh, your knowledge about a, a, a certain product. So, so if you say that, okay, that bottle is not for you, you the, the kid will learn something that this is something that I have to be careful about or maybe I'm really looking forward to get my hands on. Uh, so so there's, there's certain things that really influence our understanding of, of concepts and this is a very complex process. So learning to understand for a machine probably should go in the same kind of direction. So it, it should learn from interaction, from data, from from communication, and this is what uh, language technology people work on, uh, typically. So one, one concrete uh, project that we are running, um, so, so there's a lot of different kinds of data that we can use, and we work a lot with machine translation, and machine translation is an interesting topic here because there's data that uh, naturally occurs, so we don't really have to annotate something, we don't have to really give some gold label standards, but instead it's something that humans produce naturally, translators produce translations because we have different languages in the world, we want to make ourselves understood. Um, and as we see this kind of triangle here, that kind of symbolizes how machine translation could be modeled in a way that really reflects this part of understanding some kind of incoming language and speaking another output language, connected by the meaning that should be uh, um, um, transmitted uh, to the other person. So if we model translation, then of course we can we can model these practical things of translation, saying we translate between certain languages and not always in any case uh, you have to really go to full understanding of the meaning behind that uh, kind of sentence or whatever you want to translate. Uh, but instead you can take some shortcuts because certain things are quite mechanical. You can look up expressions in a dictionary and so on. But our idea is that if, if we uh, combine all these kind of different tasks of translating between different languages, we always have to go through some kind of level of uh, meaning representation in this model. And if we tie them together and say that, okay, our system should learn translations from all kinds of different languages, it becomes a very tough and hard task to do it in general, to translate between all languages that we can consider. And, and that's why we assume that the system would then pick up something that gets closer to, to a more 
abstract meaning representation in the middle, because now it really has to reflect all these kind of differences that you can see and observe by, by these different translations. So what I want to say here is only that we now try to use some kind of data set as a semantic uh, supervision for a system that comes naturally from data, and we can use that for, for, for building up some kind of meaning representation. And this is this Fortran project that we are running. So here is then a picture of something that looked different on my screen when I created the slide. So in the middle there is something that became a little bit uh, blurry. We had different kinds of names for the middle because we couldn't really make up your mind. I think I had universal meaning representation here in the end. Sometimes we say neural interlingua, which becomes a bit loaded sometimes. Um, but the idea is that we would build this kind of system where we can encode different kinds of languages coming in, like English, Finnish, Czech on the bottom, and then we can translate it to other languages or the same languages through some intermediate representation, which becomes e eventually by training our model uh, some, some meaning representation that uh, should be agnostic to the languages that we have covered here. So in some sense, increasing the number of languages here should then uh, at least assumed, should really increase the abstraction um, of this intermediate shared layer. So that's the idea that we want to test. And then we have some other projects that go beyond this and also try to get all these kind of other signals that you might integrate here, like audio signal, signals and video signals in the same system and integrate in a more natural way um, some, some complete system that uh, combines all these information types. And then, of course, the question is what, what, what happens to this representation here in the middle? So the next two slides give you some numbers, but I probably don't spend a lot of time on this. This is just to convince you that this seems to work uh, in, to some extent, and we have some reasonable results coming out of that. So if we now extend our systems from just bilingual models to multilingual models, we can see that in certain benchmarks where we test uh, uh, semantic abstraction or some, some kind of different tasks that we just artificially set up, uh, we can see that the ability of such a system to make, for example, natural language inference tasks goes up if you add more languages. So this is as we would expect it and quite encouraging, even though we, these numbers maybe don't say you much. Uh, the next ta table is the same, so another benchmarks. And of course, all these approximations only give us a hint whether this really goes into the right direction. So do we get better abstractions or not? So I have no idea how I'm doing with, with time, but um, Okay, good. So I was rushing through this quite quickly because I thought this is probably not the most interesting thing. It's more speculative things that might come in the future might be more interesting. Um, so don't spend too much time on that, but was just showing that, again, if you now see that, well, this example that we had, and we get this answer of yes, uh, Finland should join the NATO, then, of course, as a human, we would like to see whether the other partner or the, uh, the thing that we are communicating with really understands what it means to say that kind of response. So what the question would be is that why, why would you respond it? Give me some support for this. I have another example that comes a bit from, from some Twitter flow um, in the last days. There was also this uh, idea of that can can we really trust the systems that we are building here? I don't know, maybe some of you have seen this. So what is this autocrop um, feature that Twitter has uh, included? If you give a picture with two, actually, photographs to the system, which one of them is it deciding to crop out of this uh, system here? So here in the example, then this was Mitch McConnell that was chosen by the system. Somehow, magically, you don't know really why. Um, then they made some uh, tests also to just invert the picture, and then Barack Obama was chosen. So there's no real clue. You, can you trust such a system that just makes some decisions of, of picking, for example, one of these images? And as you can't really know, well, you can, you can probably then investigate what is happening. I think one suggestion is that maybe it's the red tie that actually makes this decision, but it's an AI system or whatever is it behind this is just based on the training data, and you don't really know what, what makes it really um, responding in this way. There's many more other examples, so of course there's a lot of these kind of uh, bias in data that you're discussing, uh, but in real life you have these predicted models that, for example, give you an idea of, of what kind of uh, insurance policies people should get, and, and these, make, uh, these algorithms make some decisions or support some decisions, and they, they can be very much biased, but you don't really know 
why the system is doing these kind of uh, decisions. So my argument is that we should have systems that really learn to comprehend, not only understand and make predictions, but instead they, they should be able to explain and interact. So the explaining part is really the important part. They should be able to detect misunderstandings. So if you interact, they should be able to really understand that maybe I misinterpreted something. And they should also be self-aware in a sense that they have recognition of, of their own lack of knowledge, so that they have some, some way of recognizing that here I'm on a thin ice prediction and I should be able to communicate my uncertainty here as well. So here, um, just last slides, I think this is very much in relation to the mission of FKI, so the Finnish Center of Artificial Intelligence, where they look at understandability and trust and ethics as well. So what I think here is really important is understandability, not only to understand people, but also making yourself understood. So the so system would, should also really be able to, un, uh, to explain itself. Again, I'm rushing a bit through this because I have to keep time. Um, so what I also think is this trust really is important to build up in a way that you, uh, a system that can explain its decisions is, is much more trustworthy. So it should be able to argue and debate it should also be able to be convinced by something else. And a system that can really ex ex uh, explain its claims becomes something that we can trust, as, as humans would also be more trustworthy if they can really support their claims. And what I also believe is that this kind of self-awareness is really important for all these steps so that you actually know, or a system would know that here I have very uncertain uh, decisions that I base my my actions on. And also this kind of learning that uh, becomes driven by, by the self-awareness of, of your own lack of knowledge. So, and of course, as I'm working with language technology, I think all these things really require language and, and language-based interaction tools, as this is a, a proven um, toolbox for, for humans, and, and why should that not work for machines? So, I'm almost done. The future of AI, I think, really see is that there's a lot of talk about interpretability and explainability. I'm not exactly sure if this is so important. I think for me, more important is that AI becomes able to explain itself, its predictions and actions. That would be a really convincing thing. I maybe don't see that uh, the internals need to be explainable and inter interpret interpretable, but instead a machine that can explain itself would be very, very convincing from my point of view. And this kind of self-awareness now, finally having my consciousness in a slide here, um, I think this kind of uh, ability of, of uh, re-evaluating its own decisions is really important. Be aware of subjectivity and misinterpretation is the important thing to make uh, systems really um, trustworthy and, um, well, a system that you can really collaborate with. And I see that language is really um, essential for all of these things. Okay, last slide, just give you these few points here that what I think is what we will focus on is that we would like to focus on, on, on developing such systems that you have generative neural language models that can really build this system that we try to explain here. So something that maps latent meaning representations, uh, but generate language from that as some kind of lossy compression of that information that we have, but we don't see it. So it should be strong and contextualized, it should be multimodal, and it should have this active learning procedure of, of really lifelong improving. And then this uncertainty about interpretation is also important, so that you know that what you interpret is just decompressing something where we don't really know whether we have the exact solution or not. So we have lossy compression that we have to start with, and we have to decompress with uncertainties, and that's what we have to uh, work with. So with this, I stop my talk and can discuss more later or now. Thank you. Thanks, Jörg. So we probably have time for one question. And uh, if anybody in the audience wants to grab that spot, I'd happily welcome you. Because we have one question on, on Pressimo. That's from me. So OK, it's going to be me. No, let's go, please, sir. that it is an alcohol 
it's not just that it is a alcohol that they shouldn't drink, but, but it's a very specific type of construct that's socially constructed. So if we don't bring these narratives of his historical context, um, it's a very limited understanding about, about this. So that's one aspect. And the second aspect is there are also prelingual uh, understandings of things about risk, safety, about values, about, uh, and this doesn't require language. Often children can already understand, they have empathy for certain things. Mm. So if we're gonna talk about AI systems and the only use language to train them, are we missing something? So yeah, no, no, I completely agree. So of, of course, I work with language technology is important for me as I work with this particular part, but I completely agree that this kind of interactive mode of agents being in an environment is really important. Um, and I think the social aspects, of course, for a machine, we can't really make them living uh, beings to, to really pick up emotions in the same way as we maybe pick them up as humans. Um, uh, so, so all these kind of interaction, there's a long way to go. I think there's uh, this example with machine translation is very much simplified, for example, that we only use language uh, in and out and, and use quite to make strong abstractions, but we will be far away from the abstractions that are really behind um, uh, our knowledge base or our kind of interpretation of world around us. So, so I completely agree. This is, this is just one big uh, puzzle of, of different kinds of things that come together. Um, not really sure if this answers your question, but I, I completely agree that language is only one small part. It's not the only, of course. But I still see it as, as the, the best tool for expressing really complex problems. That's why we use it so a lot. I mean, why do we go around here and, and talk to each other? Because language is the efficient tool that we can use for discussing details. And I don't see any better tool. Great. Yeah. That's went in mostly the same direction as I was going to ask mm. anyway, so thank you, sir. And uh, thank you, Jorg, again. Okay. So next we'll have Rita Salmelin from Alto University talking about individual fingerprints of, uh, or fingerprints of individuals in, in, in brain signals. And um, she's going to be speaking remotely. So uh, I'll hopefully, the, hopefully the studio mastery brings her up. Yeah. Okay, thank you, guys. And welcome, Rita. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. So I'm going to share the screen. We tested it. Hopefully it works. Share. Yep. So you should now see the title slide, I hope. OK, so I'm actually mostly doing language things. So it's kind of fine. I feel a bit funny now after this language talk to talk about a bit more general topic. But this is something I, I really find quite exciting. So, um, so far, uh, so we're finally in the study of human brain function, we are getting to a point where we hope to be able to address uh, some kind of big questions, uh, which are kind of big questions that so far for a long time have been, at least I have felt they have been more like a pipe dream. But now it feels like maybe after you see, so we, we can start to ask questions, at least we can already see that we may start to get there. What is unique and what is shared between individuals' brain activity? How are behavior and cortical representations linked on an individual level? How are individuals able or not to communicate and understand each other's messages, which is kind of linked to the previous talk, but in a bit of a funny way, because um, uh, of course, we're now talking about even like just um, you know, not even translating, but just different individuals. And the and how does an, the individual neural makeup influence individual disease patterns in neurological disorders? These are really important questions. I'm not going to answer them, obviously, in this talk. But what I hope to demonstrate is that um, is that the that with machine learning approaches, we can at least uh, hope to uh, we can we can at least start to find get a handle into to individual features of brain function that we can find from neuroimaging signals. So, uh, so far, uh, neuroimaging studies of human neuroimaging has mostly been about, um, um, about um, finding, um, identifying group level summary descriptions of uh, presumed processing stages. And I'll just show an example of that. So, Here's the, um, uh, so as an example, cortical processing of meaning. So you will now see some sentences. Please read them.
So you may have noticed that there were different types of sentences so that the final word, uh, the degree to which how it matched with the preceding contents varied. And of course, in reality, in, uh, in the experiment, there were the stimuli were given in Finnish. The brain activity was recorded with magnetoencephalography, MEG, and signals were averaged across 100, about 100 trials per sentence type. This sounds like a lot, but it's important because we need to get a good signal to noise ratio. And of course, the brain is doing a lot of other things. So if we want to see how it's reacting in this particular task, then we need to average across uh, comparable trials. And what we would get in this type of situation, we would be averaging responses to this, um, to the sentence ending word. And here's an example, it's just showing the active time course of activation in um, when, when the sentences are showing in the visually or when they are, they are, they are played auditorily. And um, here's a response in the superior temporal cortex. We have the, we have the time course. Uh, so that the time zero is when the word, well, that was the word onset. And we can see that, that when we have the expected sentence type, so something where the final word is absolutely expected, the piano was out of tune, everybody knows it's going to be tune. So then our brains are not actually very interested. After 200 milliseconds, when we would start to get to more cognitive processing, it's pretty flat. So really the brain is just no longer interested. It already knows what's going to happen. But when we have a totally anomalous ending, like the pizza was too hot to sing, that's a huge response, which is a response which we would typically get to any isolated word without a context. Then we have the, have the, the type, the gambler had a streak of bad luggage where the final word is, the, is wrong. It has the wrong meaning, but it actually shares its initial letters or sounds with the expected word. And in this case, we get an equally strong response, so it's wrong. But, but this uh, response is uh, delayed a little bit, which means that we are, it indicates that we are a bit fooled by the correct sounding or looking beginning before it's kind of like, oh no, no, it doesn't fit. But now the really interesting test is, the, is a condition which I would call rare meaning here where, where the, I hope this is not, okay. So when the, so the, uh, when the power went out, the house became quiet. Now, if you give the beginning of the sentence to people to fill in, most, most people would fill in dark, but quiet. When you get to that, it's, it's equally surprising as the sing and luggage, but, but, it is, um, but that then it actually fits with the sentence context. And what we then see is that um, we have a response which is here between the extrema, it's between the wrong meanings and the totally expected ones. And this type of graded response is taken to reflect uh, uh, processing a word, a word meaning. And in this case, we can see that it's, uh, it happens pretty similarly regardless of the input root. But now these are group level results. So if we're still looking at this reading condition, this is really an average across several individuals. And if we actually look at the individuals themselves, we can see that, yes, these are examples of some, some participants. We can see that overall, yes, they all kind of show pretty much the same effect, functional effect, the differentiation, but the actual exact timing of this effect and its size varies between individuals quite noticeably. So, and, and in fact, we can show that um, especially when we go to low level sensor responses, which are much easier to study in large groups of people and quantify, then, then we can show that, we can even show that some of this variation may be linked to specific genes. And auditory responses are actually a re really good example. So the auditory reactivation at, the, at 100 milliseconds after sound onset, um, it's a very stable phenomenon. And it's, it's something which we know over, there have been so many studies using, using this measure. So we know that it's reproducible within individual, within one single individual. It's pretty similar between siblings and it's quite variable across population. So that was a great candidate for studying this. And in fact, it turns out that the, um, especially the right hemisphere response strength is, can be shown to be linked with specific genes especially Robo-1, which, uh, which regulates um, uh, projections of thalamocortical axons, 
and it has been shown as a dyslexia, as, as a candidate gene for dyslexia. And TRAPC9, which, uh, which seems to have functions in synaptic signaling. But then, of course, we may ask whether this, um, this type of individual variation um, in stimulus-rated responses, uh, whether that is to what degree that is related to uh, kind of an overall uh, uh, indiv inter-individual differences in our basic neural makeup. And uh, so we can ask how individually unique is our global brain function? And here's an example of, a, of data from one subject who was resting, eyes closed, eight seconds of data, MEG data, recorded over the, over the sensory motor cortices, which are shown in blue. And the, and the red one, red curves show the response, signals recorded over the posterior part of the head, most like over visual areas. And then the frequency spectra on the right show a very typical pattern or what we, a typical structure we would see in a healthy individual, healthy adult. So that uh, in the posterior parts of the brain where we have those visual areas, the activity has a very clear peak at around 10 Hertz. So there's lots of that kind of oscillatory activity. Whereas over the sensory motor areas, it's more like a bit more widely spread 10, 20 Hertz components. So there's already structure there about the, the spectral uh, properties of the data. And kind of when you have been doing, um, uh, doing uh, brain research for a long time, you know that you get this feeling that there's something really individual and, and somehow stable in, this, in these patterns in individuals. But then intriguingly, it turned out when we, that when we applied Bayesian reduced rank regression with Sami Kaski and his colleagues on, on data from 100 sibling pairs, that we were actually to show that an, individ, an individual spatial spectral pattern can be distinguished remarkably accurately. So here we computed um, these uh, spectra, frequency spectra at all locations over the head, the MEG sensors, and the and what we aimed for was as that we would find spectral compositions, so spatial spectral components that would maximally differentiate between the phenotypes. So in this case, the families. And what we did was we used, um, uh, used 90% of, uh, of the subjects always for, for training. And then we tested the model on, on the remaining 10%. And on the right side, we have a, a coordinate system, which is spanned by now these spatial spectral components. So we take two of those components, uh, one and two spatial spectral components, and plot the, and, and dot, dots are different participants. And um, what we see here is that, that for the, when we have this two measurements of the same individual, then these dots are like really close together in this space. And also for siblings, who are shown in red here, sibling pairs, they are, these uh, dots are, are pretty close to one another. And what we also found was that now we could identify individuals with a very high accuracy across different tasks and recording sessions from only a few seconds of MEG data. And in this case, the perfect prediction would be rank one. So it's almost rank one and random prediction would be rank 10. So this is a very interesting thing. And it seemed that it was possible to do this only with, with even as few as six components, spatial spectral components. So now here we are looking at this. Um, um, so we're looking at the MEG, each of these uh, plots is an MEG helmet, which we view from, from above, flattened onto the plane with the nose, this nice little uh, thing here up up and the, so nose is always show, pointing above there. And each of these curves is showing um, the um, uh, spectral frequency spectra at each MEG sensor as a functional frequency. So the component weights of, at these sensors as a functional fre frequency from zero to 90 Hertz. And uh, just to help uh, looking at this, uh, we have this uh, red color is indicating kind of the lower frequencies and the more bluish colors are showing higher frequencies. What's obvious is that at least these first two components here, they are mostly spatial 
components. So they are kind of flat, pretty flat for the different frequencies. It's mostly the spatial distribution, spatial balance, which is evident there. But for the other components, it's a very complex composition of uh, frequency and spatial information. But nonetheless, only six. So the idea behind this uh, approach is that we have, uh, so the, is we have MEG data, which is the Y, then we have the latent space in the parenthesis. We have X information about the participants, Psi values of latent features, and then gamma, which is a projection of the latent space to MEG data. And omega and E, they reflect just noise unknown factors. So the idea he, here is that, that we predict Y given X and we learn the values of Psi. So we learn, try to learn low dimensional projection of high dimensional MEG data, taking into account information about the participants. And the participant information can be categorical or continuous. So we used here categorical information, family structure. We could equally well use, and we did use genetic data. We could at behavioral test clinical data, anything continuous. And this, the really lovely thing is that it seems to work even with a relatively small number of participants so that we don't need to have hundreds of subjects, but we can actually work on some tens of subjects, which is a much more feasible number for neuroimaging studies. So, uh, so then we could ask, are these then the, are these in the, our individual cortical fingerprints? Because this is a really like a, the first time ever that I have really seen a really strong handle onto, onto this very remarkable individual variation, I see. And, I, and of course, we don't know how well these are, how these are really linked. So future directions for research. Certainly, the first question is, are these, these kind of fingerprints, are they stable over longer periods of time? How stable are they? Are they stable with aging, for example? Also, where do they come from? So what, what is the, why are they, why do, are they so individually somehow identifying? So are they reflections of the underlying anatomical connectivity structure? So therefore kind of a simple proxy of a complex network, which would be really cool because we are getting to very complex computations all the time. So it would be nice sometimes to have something which to at least to a degree is simpler. Also, if this is true, then this type of way of identifying uh, subjects or somehow grouping them ac according to similarity of fingerprints would, I think, form a much more meaningful way of having functionally coherent subgroups, possibly therefore more salient experimental effects and more informative data than what we do now. We now implicitly think that some things are, we try to make more coherent subgroups by trying to make, take children of a similar age and adults also not for a very wide age range. And we try to have right-handed and we try to make sure that we have equally many males and females because we assume that will have a play a role. And also there are ways of choosing just one gene and saying, well, based on this one gene, we are going to, we are going to have these different groups. And this is probably fine, but kind of the whole phenotype might be much, much more informative. And finally, of course, there's a good question of whether this kind of things could offer a biomarker of, of network breakdown in neurological diseases and possibly some measure of rehabilitation potential. We do have pilot data where we, we could identify, we could distinguish between stroke patients and controls at very high sensitivity and specificity, for example. So that's a small start. So, um, so I think this is, um, I think, Personally, I feel like we are at the beginning of a new era of how we could hopefully finally get to the actual individual differences, somehow a better kind of quantification. And here are references of the, that, I, that I mentioned in, the, in the, the full references for the, what I referred to in the, in the talk. And here are my wonderful collaborators whom I would like to thank very much. And of course, I would like to thank you all remotely for being there whoever made the effort. So I'm done here and I can stop sharing. Yes. Wonderful, thank you, Rita. Um, has anybody got any questions locally? Quick question. 
Um, my my quick question is, uh, Rita, is there any sense that these fingerprints can reflect uh, the individual experience of something, like, for example, language? Since that's your, your expertise. Well, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I would be surprised if they didn't. But you see, these are all a, an egg and hen thing, because yeah. um, because the also, of course, I mean, the, all the, so we tend to think nowadays that kind of this connectivity in the way that brain areas are connected and how they function together, that's kind of the deal, big deal, even if we are often measuring local changes and drawing conclusions from that. But, but of course, the, we know that, that our structural connectivity is also, of course, influenced by our experiences. So slowly, very slowly, but if we learn something, there are always some connections which get stronger, which will influence our functional connectivity and surely, so the way we function influences the structure and vice versa. So yeah, of course, I think everything that we experience somehow influences this, but it's a question of how big the influence. So what are the biggest effects and when they are biggest? And so of course, nothing is ever totally stable, but there's probably some sort of basic me in the, in the brain as well. All right, thank you, Rita. So we'll have to go on now because of the time, but um, thank you, Rita, again. So next, I'd like to welcome up uh, Dr. Yami Pekkanen, back to the machine learning. And Yami will talk about uh, what does uh, machine learning have to do with human learning, if anything. Thank you, Yami. Take it away. How do I get my slides? Do I... No. Oh. Okay, they're probably somewhere in here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh. No spoilers there, man. Okay, good afternoon. So, my name is Yami Pekkanen, as Ben told, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at the University of Helsinki in cognitive science. And uh, I'll discuss some relationship between, relationships between machine learning and human learning or animal learning more in general and also uh, go in a bit philosophical about curviness of curves. And of course the curviness relates to this Judea Pearl statement that was in the in the call of this seminar uh, that the current state-of-the-art machine learning or so-called deep learning is just curve feeding. And this did cause some reaction in the different communities. Uh, I think sort of the usual was that they felt that uh, Judah was putting down uh, machine learning by comparing it to curve feeding. But I, I was more upset that he uh, played down curve feeding because actually I'll say you, you can formulate any uh, learning problem, like literally any learning problem as a curve feeding problem. And sort of in theory, you can solve any problem with it like, like that. It's there just in the first line. So the x best is argmax x f x just means uh, that we find the best values x, uh, or the values of x that give the best result of f. Okay, these are just small letters, but they, in this very general formulation, they can include like anything at all. So we could think f as the whole world dyma dynamics, and x, x is then uh, what an individual organism can do. So you could, for example, solve uh, the whole learning, the evolution and individual development problem with just this one formulation. So curve fitting is like almost everything there is. But of course, well, there are a few caveats. It's a quite difficult thing to squeeze the whole world into that F and the whole, uh, whole uh, organism into that X and sort of I, I think Judah was 
using the curve fitting quite loosely here. He probably knows, actually knows how awesome this thing is. And he does elaborate on the interview uh, that he calls for um, machines with models of the environment, which uh, sort of limits what the Fs and the X can be. And uh, I sort of agree that the state-of-the-art uh, machine learning ac actually doesn't really have these models of the environment. So it's, a, it's still, it, it is a uh, curve-fitting problem, but it's a very specific one in that uh, sort of usually the, well, here, here, here the function is sort of the difference between the, uh, what's the input and then the desired output, and then it sort of finds a bestish uh, solution for this specific problem. And there are quite a bit of limitations of what actually the function, how complicated the function can be. It, it's, uh, they, seem, see, they seem to capture quite complicated dynamics, but uh, there are some quite fundamental limitations. Uh, and also, uh, may maybe even bigger problem is that it needs data, it needs lots of data in very specific format. So it's like, uh, well, I'll get back to that later, but this is, this is quite a bit of, uh, this is a problem for, uh, for trying to model, for example, human behavior or animal behavior with this. But uh, actually, Judah wasn't putting down uh, machine learning. He, he clearly says that he's very impressed with the current uh, developments in machine learning and deep learning stuff. And I agree with, uh, with Judah that he should be, because it is really impressive. Uh, for example, even I used to use as an example still in like up to 2010, that there's no way that computers can tell apart cats and dogs if you give them pictures. This was one of the sort of stereotypical problems that was thought to be way outside the realm of, of what we can do with the current state of art. I think there was some umbrella problem that was also uh, often discussed. Uh, but nowadays, like this, this is from a tutorial. This is something you can hack together in five minutes, copy pasting from the internet, and it, it does a really good job of telling apart cats and dogs, uh, and even boasts by putting in Elon Musk there for some weird reason. But sort of the why why this was thought to be impossible or very difficult is that uh, we. Don't, we can't really state the structure, what makes a cat different from a dog, like in every situation. It's, it's very hard to put, put that in some logical propositions or, or even like uh, general approximation functions. But it seems that if you just put enough parameters and have enough data, you can sort of brute force your way into telling about part cats and dogs. Uh, so while the supervised ML is indeed impressive, its intelligent is a bit suspect. So it's well known that uh, it exhibits some weird behavior or something that we usually don't attribute to intelligent beings or at least human behavior. So this is an example from an article when you have a dog first, uh, the network is, I think, the AlexNet, one of the sort of networks that revolutionized this field. Uh, and then you add some weird looking noise that is bamboozle here. And then for, for a human being and arguably for any intelligent being, it looks all more or less exactly the same. But for some reason now, the network is very confident that that's, that is an ostrich and not a dog. And this is uh, sort of seems to be a limitation that it, uh, these networks seem to do some brute for force learnings that somehow don't really seem to capture the essence of the things, but they sort of do a very good statistics about the colors and the structure of the sort of neighboring pixels and things like that. And it works often in practice, but you can 
uh, sort of make it fail if you really want to, which pro probably is a lot more difficult to bamboozle people like this, or even dogs. And also another problem is that these these kinds of networks don't really act, so so they more more do they just give give answers to questions and very specific types of questions and give very specific type of answers. So they sort of just do uh, by road learning or Pike is a fish learning. I don't know why that's a saying in Finnish, but at least so so they are given dogs pictures, for example, pictures, and then they have to say if it's a dog or a cat, but that's sort of all it can do. Uh, and it, it, it doesn't really try, try to do anything, it doesn't try to operate in any world, it just does this question-answer thing. Uh, well, you can formulate actually this question-answer thing to do some behavior, like you can actually <coughs> For example, drive a car to a very limited extent by just teaching, sort of having a human driving the car, and then you capture the input that the human sees, and then it just tries to mimic the car, uh, mimic the human steering the car. But these usually tend to fail quite spectacularly when they go a bit outside of the sort of environment they were trained in. Uh, here in, in the quote, actually, there was uh, this other statement from Judah Pearl that the first step, one that will take place in maybe 10 years, is that conceptual models of reality will be programmed by humans. Uh, and I, I sort of agree, and, and now in this, because machine learning has become this weird word that means anything, it sort of is synonymical to AI for some reason, then everything is about learning, but learning is actually just one quite small part, uh, arguably, of what is an intelligent thing. There are plenty of intelligent things that don't learn. Like, uh, well, I even even if you if you'd stop learning at the moment, you can arguably still behave quite well. Sort of, uh, in, is, you are uh, arguably intelligent, even if your whole memory would be toast or something like that. You can. Uh, probably eat and sleep and walk around and do stuff that are actually quite difficult things to do. Uh, but if, if we go way simpler, I argue that, for example, a thermostat in your uh, radiator is an intelligent system uh, in that it adapts to its environment, it has some goal and it, it uh, has sort of an it makes observations of the environment and somehow intelligently uses those to guide its behavior. Another example could be like this fancy cruise controller you may have in your newer cars that try to keep up, keep the distance to the car ahead of them in some nice, uh, keep a nice distance to the car ahead of them. Uh, and uh, actually, there is uh, there is sort of this more general formulations of things that do this are called MDPs, and you probably have quite a few in your laptops or phones. They are quite often used to control things like fans or or battery usage levels or something like that, or uh, CPU frequencies. So the MDP is short for Markovian Decision Process, uh, which is a formalis formalism for doing this intelligent thing, like having observation, then inferring the state of the world some way, and then acting based on that. It's uh, formally put, it quite, seems quite complicated, has lots of fancy words, but uh, I think the, uh, the framework itself is quite simple in that sort of you take the world, you observe it, and then you somehow intelligently merge your previous information with the observations, and then you predict uh, how the world would evolve depending on what uh, action you do, and then you do your 
best and the world reacts and the loop goes round. So sort of here's an example of what your automatic fancy cruise controller could be doing. So uh, it measures the distance using radar or video or something like that. But of course those measurements are noisy and sometimes missing, but luckily if it's intelligent, it knows sort of the, the parameters or the uh, how probable it is that actually the car ahead just abruptly stops in a millisecond, which is very, very unlikely, or goes past the speed of light and sort of, well, and, and you can learn a lot more subtle probabilistic representations of the, uh, of the world around you. And then use those sort of to intelligently merge the observations to get better idea of the world. Oh yeah, I went over that. So, so in this case, it's the distance and the speed. You know, the distance, even if you don't measure the speed itself, you can sort of compute it based on the distance measure, measurements in time, which is sort of intelligent. And then you just need to know whether to give more throttle or more brake to keep the distance in the set value. Uh, in my PhD, I actually did this very similar thing that I modeled humans as uh, adaptive cruise controllers or smart cruise controllers based on this MDP framework. Uh, and it, well, I, I won't go into details, but it's even though the graph here is quite intimidating, the model itself is sort of simple when you get the formalism, but it's. It, uh, in the same time, it's not totally implausible that humans could do something like this or sort of has relatively realistic measurements and, and the model, internal model it uses to predict the world is actually probably a lot simpler that, than human, humans have. But nevertheless, it, it manages to uh, capture quite well how people keep their distance to the car ahead of them in different situations and it can capture uh, differences between drivers so they will be have different parameters of those ACCs. <coughs> <coughs> so you may wonder what is this weird thing there? Well, not only <coughs> did we predict the uh, distance controlling but also we then predicted the attention that the drivers allocate to the task. So we, we used in simulator just this white box and in real car this uh, weird screen that you can toggle transparent and opaque by a press of a button and sort of it, it meant to be an analog of you driving while looking cat pictures and of course you want to look cat pictures but then you have to take a peek every now and then not to crash into uh, into the car ahead of you. And uh, well, without going into details, you can actually formulate this attention sharing as managing the uncertainty in the MDP. And sort of the uncertainty is, is, is a fundament, quite fundamental thing probably for these things, that some, something to be managed with observations and actions in order to sort of operate in this quite chaotic world. Uh, well, yeah, there, there we modeled uh, when, when you need to look at the car ahead in this specific case, but now we're moving forwards with this uh, line of research with even simpler experiments, because I think people should do more simple experiments. Most experiments are way too complicated in behavioral sciences. And also, well, this allows us to keep the maths, ma math somehow manageable. So what you see here in fancy colors is just that we are trying to make models of how people predict trajectories of objects. So if you sort of see a ball thrown at you, how, how well can you predict uh, ahead of time where the ball will land or where is it, it is at the moment when you can maybe see it. And we are trying to build these mathematical models that then try to do sort of do the same eye movements and same predictions or very similar predictions than humans and then arguably capture something about the human uh, 
attention and observation behavior. Uh, okay, so those things are hand-coded, like Judea called for, for the next step. Within 10 years, we've done it already, don't tell him. Uh, so then, then, well, he puts it complicated in complicated terms, but the model should learn also. So you should be able to learn these MDPs, these things that have the idea of how the world works and know how to predict their consequences. And actually, there is sort of a framework for doing this. Uh, very closely related to Markovian decision processes are, is reinforcement learning, uh, which, well, more or less is just taking the MDP and then have, a, have this mechanism of trying to figure out what actions to take in whatever world state. And sort of on paper, it is really powerful. It's, it's, it's a curve-fitting formulation again, it's, but it's a very different curve from the uh, supervised learning, and it's also a very different fitting process from the supervised learning. And the nice thing is, is, is that it actually acts. You can even put, put an algorithm like this into the robot, and it could, could go around and sort of explore and try to learn the world, world by itself. Uh, well, one, one problem here is that this is actually very difficult to get working properly. You can get toy examples working. Maybe you could get an ACC working, but when you, if you put a steering in there, you, you probably get beyond what's, what's possible with the current state of the art. Uh, there are, are, this is an active, active area of research, and I think it's sort of coming up in a hype, hype cycle somewhat. And for example, the AlphaGo that won in Go and chess, well, of course, the humans, humans stuck at chess, and well, now apparently at Go as well, but also all previous computers by wide margins without having any hand-coded rules in the system. So it didn't really know anything about how to play chess before. Uh, and these usually, and, and AlphaGo and similar systems do use these deep learning uh, methods to quite, quite uh, to sort of, uh, manage the vast complexity of the, of the world. Okay, I'm out of time, so my conclusion is that curve fitting is fine, we just need better curves and better fitting. Thank you. Does anybody have a question uh, locally for Yami on this topic? So, um, yeah, please. I don't want to be the only one asking questions. Yeah. What a question for me is that are we trying too hard to mimic human intelligence when we build these machine learning systems? Pardon, can you repeat? Are we trying to, too hard to mimic human intelligence because maybe there are other models of intelligence that might be more interesting, for example, viruses. If we think of viruses as being intelligent, we think of them as distributed, we think of them as using survival as a tactic to learn and adapt. Um, that's not really how we train our machine learning systems today. No. Um, because they're not out in the world, they're not dealing with survival. And so I think genetic algorithms at some point were trying to use that framework, but they were not very successful either. So I'm wondering if we need a new framework to build collective intelligence systems that are not reliant on centralized, centralized models of data, which may not even be available for certain context. Well, uh, well, it depends on what we want to do. I think that's sort of a because the leap is often made from machine learning to sort of modeling behavior. But machine learning is just fine as it is, even though it didn't work like human, humans or animals in general. So it's, you can have very different types of intelligent behaviors, and there's sort of nothing wrong with that. Of course, I'm doing cognitive science, so uh, by job description, I sort of have to just try to study some, some animal. I probably could study viruses if I could get an interesting enough perspective on those. But I sort of, if, if, we, if we want to model this, how organisms were like viruses or mice or humans or cats, I, I agree with you that we should, that probably the way to go is to use these more acting models that w 
observe the environment somehow and make some uh, take some actions to uh, roam around and and try to make inference rather than having this like a by road teacher telling you that the answer to this is this and this is this and then having you to extrapolate. Thanks. I think that's all we have time for. So thank you, Yami. Thank you. You take your machine. <laughs> and next I'll uh, welcome Rieke Mertenen again calling in remotely from the UK, I believe. And um, Rieke is going to talk about um, language learning and uh, cognitive neuroscience of language learning. And um, if we have her, not yet. Enrique will also be joining uh, the Cognitive Science Unit in 2021. Welcome. Okay, hello, hello Great. everyone, and thanks for inviting me to um, speak in this seminar um, today. Uh, sorry for not being able to be there yet in person. Um, so I'm going to talk about language learning uh, today. And um, for the past 10 years or so, <laughs> I've, uh, I started all of my talks with this figure and I won't do any exception today. So um, I'm interested in uh, speech and language and what is essential for speech and language is that uh, they are communication tools. So we use these um, signals to communicate with each other. And also importantly for today's talk, we learn speech and language in interaction with other people. Um, so I'm uh, specifically interested in how the different mechanisms um, in, um, in the human brain, like auditory, motor, and cognitive mechanisms. How do they interact um, to enable us to um, communicate using speech and language? So in today's talk, um, I'm going to focus on statistical language learning, which I'm going to explain in a bit more detail in a minute. And I'm going to uh, discuss the roles of um, auditory motor speech processing and higher order cognitive mechanisms in statistical language learning. And I'm going to um, present some experimental evidence from other labs and from my own lab that um, auditory motor speech processing supports um, our ability to learn language and that um, the higher order cognitive mechanisms that develop late compete with statistical language learning, learning mechanisms. And this actually, this may be part of the explanation why adults um, do not learn languages as efficiently as children do. And then at the end of my talk, um, I will, yeah, say something about the implications of this research for, uh, for AI research. Okay, so statistical language learning. So it's basically um, ability to extract regularities from the environment, which is um, important for all kinds of learning and intelligent behavior. But this, um, this ability to accept regularities is, of course, very important also for language learning. And in that case, the, our environment is often other people's um, continuous speech, where there are no, no breaks uh, between words or any kind of um, obvious rules. And statistical language learning is considered to be one of the core mechanisms that infants use when they start to learn language. So in her famous paper from 1996 already, and Jenny Safran showed that um, eight month um, old babies can do statistical learning and do uh, word segmentation when they are exposed to continuous streams of speech. 
but there's also evidence that this this actually may may be an um, innate um, ability. So we are born with uh, statics and language learning abilities, and that, that may help us to start to learn language at early um, in early in life. But also adults uh, um, kind of have this ability to a certain extent. Um, and as already said, the statistical language uh, learning enables us to extract words and rules from continuous sequences or speed sounds. So here's an example of a paradigm probably used in thousands of studies uh, uh, until now. So the participants are typically exposed to stream of syllables um, and um, they don't even need to pay attention to these streams. And um, these streams then um, include some hidden words that repeat over and over again during this exposure phase. So for example, here we have tupiro, golabu, bidaku, parita, and so on. Um, <clears throat> and then, yeah, participants are exposed to this. They don't even, they probably don't even, um, um, they can be doing something else when they are exposed to them. And then afterwards, um, will use some kind of test to figure out whether they whether their brains actually learn these words. So whether um, <clears throat> uh, they kind of know that uh, two people was part of this, uh, was, a was one of the hidden words in this artificial language. So we could, yeah, often do a recognition task where we present two words, one of, one of the words was the, um, a word that was presented in the exposure and typically our participants are above chance in this task. So they, they would pick two piro in, in, instead of pila pa that was never presented during, during exposure. So this has turned out to be a really um, um, nice experiment tool to investigate um, uh, language learning. However, um, it is kind of poorly understood um, what are the neural mechanisms underlying statistical language learning. And also um, um, it's well known that adults show quite a lot of individual variability in their ability to perform uh, in this task. Um, so last year, um, Quite an interesting paper was published from um, by Florence Yasenia from David Peppel's lab, where they kind of showed quite a surprising connection between um, statistical language learning ability and auditory word, um, auditory speech uh, processing. So I'll go through these um, results now. So, um, so Asenia presents. Um, quite a simple uh, audio motor or use a quite simple audio motor task in which um, uh, the participants are presented with uh, sequences of speech sounds through headphones. And then at the same time, um, they are asked to whisper ta, 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 uh, without any specific instruction. And what she found was that um, about half of her participants kind of tended to automatically or spontaneously synchronize their speech moments with their auditory speech rhythm, whereas half of the people uh, completely ignored the rhythm and just created their own, own speech rhythm for whispering. <clears throat> And then what she showed next that these, these two groups um, do differ in their ability um, to, do, to perform in statistical language learning task. So the, uh, the result is, uh, is presented here. So low, uh, both groups perform above chance in the, in the recognition task that I explained to you earlier. 
but the high, high synchronizers are perform significantly better. So they seem to have some kind of advantage in this task. So then she also looked at the um, uh, kind of entrainment of um, uh, brain signals to these uh, sequence of speech sounds while participants were now just listening um, uh, to the sequences. And what she demonstrated was that these um, frontal um, areas that are normally used for speech production actually um, track the rhythm um, of the um, speech sequences. And this um, tracking was more accurate um, in uh, high synchronizers versus uh, low synchronizers. And then, yeah, importantly, this was only luring listening, no, uh, no whispering involved. Uh, so these results kind of suggest that the speech production areas are kind of implicitly used to track syllable rate during listening. And the, the ability or the spontaneous tracking in the uh, motor system actually improves statistical language learning and explains uh, individual uh, variability. Um, However, this is just correlational evidence. So um, it would be interesting to know whether the speech production areas also have a causal role. So I would have wanted to test this using um, TMS that are used quite a lot in my research, but due to obvious reasons, I wasn't able to do that in the summer. So with my students, we designed some um, online experiments in which um, uh, we use articulatory suppression. So we ask our participants to whisper uh, while they were exposed to these structured syllable sequences. Um, and what we kind of predicted that if the motor system is important for le statistical learning, then while you're whispering, um, that should um, um, suppress kind of the activity in the motor system and impair your ability uh, to do statistics, perform in statistical language learning task. And this is what we found. We also found um, kind of a general difference between high and low synchronizers, but importantly, all of our participants uh, or both groups were performed above chance when way they were uh, exposed to speech sequences and they were just listening. But when these speech sequences were exposed, they were when they were exposed to them while they were themselves listening, they their performance um, uh, dropped to the chance level. So this shows that, or at least is in agreement with the idea that perhaps these motor uh, speech production areas really have a causal role in, um, in, in language learning, or at least in this type of statistical language learning. Um, so I will now move, move on to the kind of the second part of my talk and focus on higher cognitive functions. Um, so with my colleague, uh, Dr. Elena Small from Kent University, so we've been, we've been interested in kind of finding out why adults do not learn languages as effortlessly as children, although they have better uh, higher cognitive functions. So it's kind of paradoxical that adults have this really highly developed um, uh, cognitive machinery and they are able to do lots of demanding things but still they they don't uh, learn languages as easily as as children do and we have uh, kind of um, proposed a competitive uh, model of language learning so we um, and in this model the higher cognitive functions uh, compete with um, um, kind of low level, early developing mechanisms uh, that support language learning, like for example, the auditory motor system. 
<clears throat> and uh, uh, a key prediction of this model is that if we uh, suppress uh, or disrupt the higher cognitive functions, that should reduce competition between um, with the auditory motor system or other <laughs> kind of early level uh, mechanisms. And, uh, and consequently, that would boost uh, implicit language learning and extraction of uh, implicit knowledge from speech sequences. Okay, so um, we tested this um, idea by using using TMS, continuous theta burst stimulation that is known to kind uh, interfere with uh, normal functioning of brain areas. And we de develop, delivered um, CMS over the left dorsal prefrontal cortex, which is one of the highest level uh, cortical areas that supports cognitive control and execute functions. And also it's known to develop really late. So it develops until early uh, adulthood. And then in, in another group of participants, we uh, stimulated conscious side um, over vertex. And then um, <clears throat> after kind of um, creating the disruption uh, in the dorsal prefrontal cortex, our participants were exposed to these uh, continuous streams of speech sounds, including hidden words. And that lasted for 20 minutes. And during that exposure, we also recorded EEG. And then after a 15 minute break, we, um, um, they performed this uh, classic um, recognition task. Um, and we added one, one um, kind of component. So each time they uh, picked a word that sounded familiar to them, they had to uh, indicate whether they actually remembered the word from the sound sequence or whether they just guessed or whether it just, just sounded familiar. So this was to differentiate between explicit and implicit learning mechanisms or memory traces. So this is um, what we see when we look at the uh, EEG signal uh, recorded during exposure. So if you first look at this uh, blue line, so that is when participants are just exposed to random sequences. So what we can see here is a peak of entrainment or coherence in this case um, um, at syllable frequency, which was about uh, three hertz. But then this red line here is that when they are um, uh, exposed to structured sequences containing these hidden words. So what we can see then is that this entrainment goes down at syllable frequency, but um, it, ha it enhances um, at the word frequency. So in a way, the brains then start to um, synchronize um, with the word level frequency, not the uh, not anymore with the uh, syllable level frequency, and we can calculate the word learning index using these two peaks. And what we found was that the um, the group that um, had this cognitive disruption uh, um, um, learned more uh, during the exposure phase relative to the control group. So they both learn, they bo both, this word learning index is higher than uh, during the structured blocks than during the random block, but um, the, um, the group that had a disruption in the dorsal frequency cortex seems to have an advantage. So they learn more already during exposure. Um, and this was also seen in uh, the recognition task. So the um, control group performed above chance in the recognition task, so they learned something, <laughs> but uh, and the dorsal prefrontal cortex group performed better. 
And also, interestingly, we looked at separately the trials when the participants indicated that they they guessed they have no clue whether their response is uh, their response was correct or not. Um, and then we can we can see this difference also for those guest trials, which kind of um, tells us that. Um, um, the participants were not aware of this um, improved learning. So the those are the prefrontal cortex disruptions make them learn better, but they didn't know what they what they learned during the exposure. Okay, so time to um, some conclusions. Um, so our results um, do support um, the competitive model. So we see evidence that if you disrupt the cognitive system, that enhances implicit language learning. So um, what we think is that uh, the late developing cognitive mechanism competes with earlier developing statistical language learning mechanisms into adult brain. And this is at least part of the um, explanation why adults do not learn languages as efficiently as children do. Um, and um, th this kind of cognitive disruption um, is a way to unlock the infant light language learning mechanisms in, in adults, which may have uh, even some kind of practical implications for uh, language learning. Okay, so I hope I still have a few minutes. Um, so I would like to say something about the implications of this research for AI. So um, the statistical language learning, which I focus in this task, um, is a relatively easy task for AI. I think it would be quite easy to uh, um, write an algorithm or train a neural net to do this kind of word segmentation from continuous uh, streams of speech sounds. Um, and maybe the, the, the kind of the performance of humans doesn't really impress any, <laughs> any AI researchers. So the humans are above chance, but they are nowhere perfect in this task. So, it seems that the human ability to extract linguistic knowledge from sequences since uh, speed sounds is based on multiple mechanisms that also have different roles. And these mechanisms uh, develop at different rates. So some are innate, some, some develop until uh, uh, adulthood. And also these mechanisms can interact either cooperatively or competitively. Um, so I would like to suggest that the, the brain inspired AI should take into account this, uh, the cognitive development and the complex uh, neurocognitive architecture underlying language, language learning. <clears throat> and perhaps um, this is the only way to develop adult-like language abilities in artificial systems. Uh, and also maybe this applies also for general intelligence. So idea <clears throat> is not new. So I will finish with a quote from Alan Turing from 1950. So he wrote already then then that instead of trying to produce a program uh, to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce one which simula uh, simulates the child's? If this were then subjected to an appropriate course of education, one would obtain an adult brain. Uh, so maybe now, 70 years later, time is right to even try this approach. Um, so that we would start with um, kind of early level uh, mechanisms um, that infants have when they are born and then um, um, expose these um, um, infant robots to a natural um, interaction with human beings and, and real world. Um, thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Rika. And uh, again, I could use one question to the floor if anybody has one. And uh, if if not, um, then I would go on with uh, Michael Lakasuo, who who is um, next up as a speaker. And uh, Michael Lakasuo is a docent in the University of Helsinki, studying. Come on up, Michael. Is studying. Um, Moralities of intelligent machines for many years now, and he's going to talk to us about uh, morality and, and AI. Thank you, Michael. So, just yeah, there we go. Um, I'm not at my best today. I'm not feeling very well. I suddenly got. Uh, nauseous and I'm going through some personal issues, so I'm also having a small panic attack at the moment, so uh, I'm sorry for possible uh, bad performance uh, in complete sentences and zoning out or whatever. I will do my best to uh, deliver what I need to say, but um, I will also probably need to cut it a bit short for not feeling too well. So yes, um, I study human-AI relations, specifically human-AI moral relations. Uh, I'm a PI, I uh, run, run a team of about eight people. We have been studying all sorts of topics. For instance, how do people feel about forced medication decisions made by uh, nursing robots? How do people feel about AIs? making decisions about euthanasia, how do people feel about rescue robots who decide to uh, rescue guilty parties in an accident over innocent, and uh, many more topics similar to that. But um, today I will talk about human moral intuitions towards the brain and uh, towards uh, technologies that possibly alter uh, the human brain function. I don't have any slides because the statistics and the pictures that I can get from those statistics, they're actually quite boring. They're just uh, bar charts. And uh, I guess the point of summarizing eight, nine studies can be more easily just packed into, packed into uh, just short sentences and simple language. So uh, we have prepared uh, two papers very recently and uh, have sent them to peer review. Uh, I will talk about those. Uh, the first one is uh, a paper where we ran uh, six studies where we investigated how people feel about uh, silicon-based chips that are inserted into human brain to either fix existing memory problems, uh, low IQ, or uh, mood regulation uh, systems. And uh, these sorts of studies have some societal relevance as well because we have major companies today that are trying to create uh, chips that could be inserted into the human brain and either indeed fix existing uh, neurological problems, restore vision, restore hearing, or possibly uh, help with human memory functioning. Uh, there have already been uh, proofs of concept types of studies where they have shown that inserting electrodes into the human brain can, for instance, boost human memory performance. Uh, and then this allows for creation of an extra interface between the human brain and uh, computers and machines, uh, most notably Elon Musk's uh, Neuralink or Neural Lace is a vision where, like, a a net is inserted between the human skull and the human brain, and that could read uh, neural impulses from the top of the human brain and then send them via Wi-Fi signal to a computer so that there could actually be a brain-computer interface, which would be 
highly efficient. Uh, Elon Musk talks about this technology in a recent Joe Rogan podcast and also in uh, artificial intelligence podcast run by another uh, upcoming podcast star, Lex Friedman. So if you are interested about those technological details and where that research is going according to Elon Musk, then you should check those. But uh, as far as I can tell, there's a little bit of hype there uh, from Elon Musk. But what do I know? I'm not the person who develops this. What I study is how people feel about such technologies. Um, with these technologies, there is a potential for increasing further the divide between the haves and have-nots in our society. So people who can afford, for instance, uh, brain-computer interfaces or microchips that could enhance their cognitive performance uh, would be then proportionally more, uh, like, more privileged, more uh, have a advantage over those who cannot afford these technologies. And then it could start um, a societal change where there is a pressure for everybody to eventually adapt such technologies. So in, in our five, six studies, we uh, wanted to see how people would feel about something like this. So we presented them with a short science fiction story where an office worker who has uh, memory problems, uh, a beginning dementia of sorts, goes to the doctor, and then the doctor, uh, after having done diagnosis, recommends that he takes, this is now the uh, experimental manipulation, recommends that he either takes a chip that uh, alleviates the problem but doesn't completely remove it, or takes a chip that uh, gives him a performance level of a young person, or gives him a superhuman memory performance. And what we repeatedly find in our studies is uh, that people more or less like the fact or accept the fact that these sorts of technologies are used to fix something. But as soon as this technology is used to gain superhuman memory performance or uh, people get a superhuman IQ or get uh, a superhuman ability to regulate their emotions or their moods, uh, the approval rate of these technologies drops. We also manipulated in our studies whether this sort of technology is already familiar, that it's already something that is established in the society, or whether it is something that is new and upcoming experimental. If the technology is experimental, the approval rates are uh, more even, like people do not uh, feel so strongly morally about getting superhuman abilities because then they possibly perceive that there are implicit risks involved with such technologies. But what we also find is that people find uh, it fair if, if people who have memory problems, they fix existing problems, that's considered to be fair or okay, fairness-wise, but it's considered unfair if people try to get a superhuman memory performance. Interestingly enough, we also find we measured uh, a level of dehumanization. So how uh, are you perceived as less human or more human if you take uh, chips in your brain? If you take the chips into your brain to fix an existing problem, whether it is to the level of young person or just alleviate the problem, you, your uh, humanness is perceived to increase. But if you use this technology to get a superhuman performance, then you are considered to be less human. You are dehumanized. This, uh, so when we observed this uh, dehumanization aspect of this technology, we were wondering like, what, like, what could explain this? Why would this happen? So then we wanted to see if it's a matter of like the surgical procedure. So if you break the human uh, body envelope, the, you break the skin, it, maybe that is something that people might be disgusted by and that might explain the dehumanization. That wasn't the case. Uh, we 
made several manipulations in our studies. So then, then we tried to observe it from another angle rather than try to see whether it's some situational factor, the, ex the level of familiarity with the technology or how widespread it is in the society or uh, whether it is experimental or not, whether it breaks the body envelope or not. We, we tried to see if it's about exposure to the idea of having a chip in your brain. And then what we found was that people who read a lot of science fiction, science fiction enthusiasts, these people don't show the dehumanization aspect of the moral condemnation. And they also do not perceive it to be unfair if you take chips in your head. So this is like habituation sort of control, like you get accustomed to an idea, then the uh, then, then you feel more okay with it. But we didn't just focus on how much you get exposed to some moral ideas or uh, technological ideas. We also tried to measure some more biological aspects of human uh, moral cognition. For instance, we know already from uh, previous studies and uh, like the previous research tradition in moral cognition and moral psychology that uh, there is this human tendency to feel disgust. Uh, we feel disgust towards pathogens and uh, bodily secretions because bodily secretions of other people are possible disease vectors. Uh, so we tend to avoid stuff that uh, has certain type of viscosity. Uh, for instance, snot or saliva, we get disgusted by those. And you can use your imagination and figure out towards what else do we feel disgusted. So this is one type of disgust. But then there is another type of disgust called sexual disgust, which uh, is a very basic human uh, disgust sensitivity. So uh, uh, disgust sensitivity is normally distributed in the population. So some people are more easily sexually disgusted and some people are less. I'm not going to go into the details of how we measured it, but it's a questionnaire instrument, uh, highly validated and used a lot. But sexual disgust sensitivity seems to predict uh, sort of conservative attitudes, whatever that might mean in today's world, uh, but uh, traditional family values, uh, more tendency to be monogamous, uh, resistance to uh, the use of psychoactive substances, drug use. But in any case, so this sexual disgust then, it was very uh, important explaining uh, factor in what kinds of people or who uh, condemns the use of uh, brain implanted chips. So when your sexual disgust sensitivity goes up, you dehumanize those people who take uh, chips in their heads. and. Uh, Sexual disgust sensitivity seems to also uh, be quite indiscriminate of whether the chips inserted into somebody's head are there to alleviate problems or whether they are there to give superhuman memory IQ or uh, uh, mood regulation performances or capabilities. So what we have here is then like, we know then that uh, science fiction familiarity, so meaning basically cultural influences, uh, influence how uh, moral attitudes uh, are influenced, or like how moral attitudes towards technology are influenced. And, but we also found, find that there is a biological component. So both like biology, human biology and human culture, both influence how people feel about uh, brain or cognition enhancement. So that's sort of interesting. So uh, we now can use technology studies and brain enhancement studies to sort of separate between uh, environmental influences and biological influences in the formation of uh, moral attitudes or how moral cognition uh, is sort of um, 
regulated or formed in humans. And um, then we also, in our studies, we asked people, uh, like, would you take such a chip into your own head? And uh, we then tried to see what would predict people's tendency to answer yes to this question. And what we found out was, after a lot of analyzing, it's a long story, what we found out was that people are, uh, they're exponentially more likely to say, yes, I would take such a chip, depending on how many of, how, or how large a proportion of the general population would be willing to take it. So if I know that 60% of you would be likely to take the chip, I would be more likely to take the chip than if only, let's say, 10 or 20% of you would be uh, willing to take such a chip. Four minutes. Yeah, thanks. So that's sort of, that's sort of cool. Uh, you, can, you can then like bring all of these like socio, um, social, psychological or cultural studies factors into cognitive science and uh, see how being human today is relevantly and intimately tied with uh, technological developments and you can sort of understand how attitudes towards technology are formed, but also the developing technology also gives us sort of a mirror to investigate and observe how human uh, moral attitudes are formed. Um, since I still have three minutes, I can also talk about our so-called uh, mind upload or brain upload studies. We have run uh, five or six studies on how people feel about a technology that makes a copy of the human brain inside a computer and that transfer of the human brain into the computer destroys the brain in the process. Uh, it's also a long and a complicated story, but what we found out in that case was also that science fiction familiarity predicts approval and again, sexual disgust sensitivity predicts disapproval of such technologies or their use. So it's not like you just find these two culprits in one setting, you find them also in another setting. So uh, in the case of mind upload, we also ran some follow-up studies and we were interested in like, further investigating what sorts of people, who, who is interested in possibly copying their brain into a computer because uh, it, it's also a long discussion, but theoretically it could give you an eternal life, so who is interested? So we wanted to investigate whether people who are selfish uh, and calculative and callous would be more interested in these technologies than people who are not. And what we found out after lots of statistics and complicated uh, data processing was that, yes, indeed, these people are more willing to support development of such technologies, even after you control for their sexual disgust sensitivity and their general tendency to uh, have utilitarian attitudes. So uh, we measured utilitarianism with a heavy instrument uh, known as the trolley dilemma, but there's a, actually a whole stack of trolley dilemmas. So the trolley dilemma is uh, the dilemma that there's a trolley going downhill and it's about to uh, run over five people but you can uh, pull a lever and guide it to another track where it will only kill one person. But uh, trolley dilemmas are a whole uh, tradition in moral psychology and when you average across let's say 12 different types of more uh, trolley type dilemmas you get a utilitarianism score. So people who are high in utilitarianism are also more likely to support uh, mind upload technologies and their development, but the thing seems to be that the effect still goes through uh, this callousness or psychopathic tendencies. So that's also interesting. So when you control for people's tendency for utilitarianism, psychopathy or Machiavellianism, this calculated form of psychopathy, 
and sexual disgust, you still find this uh, effect that people who are willing to develop these technologies might be doing so with uh, dark motivations. Uh, but I guess that's my 20 minutes. Um, feel free to ask. I'm sorry about the uh, incoherent uh, performance today, but uh, that, that's the best I can do. Thanks. that that's a good thing, but they would be kind of uncomfortable adding that to a normal human for superhuman capabilities. So that's perhaps something to cons consider. But the other dimension I wanted to bring up is people's political leaning, uh, may ideology might have something to do with it. So a libertarian or a neoliberal attitude where the self and individuality is more important than a communal context could also define how we think of technology in society. And the joke about people driving fast cars and being assholes is, is not untrue. It's been verified by empirical evidence, but it has to do with some individualism and neoliberal attitude as well. So there may be something there to be consider, concerned with. Short, I can also say that uh, we, we have actually looked at this to, uh, to make, again, a complicated story short. It seems to be the case indeed uh, that, let's see if I can quickly, that people who are sort of liberal leaning are, they have less problems with moral acceptance and perception of unfairness of uh, brain implant chips. And uh, they are also less likely to dehumanize superhuman performances. You are correct, we have studied that. Also, in our uh, mind upload studies, we did control for left-right political leanings. Uh, and indeed, it seems to be the case that uh, there is an effect of political ideology, but it is, it is also separate from sexual disgust and science fiction hobbyism. It's an additional factors. So that's also interesting how uh, development of new technologies and studying people's reactions to those helps us understand the nature-nurture debate, especially with respect to uh, moral cognition and possibly the uh, environmental effects in attitude formation. So I think it's an exciting time to be a moral psychologist because you, indeed you are correct. You can bring in all of these factors together like religiosity, political leanings, more biological forms of uh, moral attitude formation and like all these things, it's, it's, it's interesting. Okay, great, thank you Michael. Thank you. So now, I'd like to keep you here just for a few more minutes, I'll let you, like I understand you want to get away and bring uh, the other speakers um, back on board and hopefully we've still got at least Rita on the Zoom call. Do um, we get to sit? Yeah, you can sit or stand. I'm going to stand. <sighs> I promised a, a panel discussion and uh, time control gets away from you when there's these multiple sources of um, of input. So we're out of... We don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to just ask one question and kind of, kind of ask you to go round robin. I don't know if we'll get Rita back, but anyway, we can start with you gentlemen. And. Um, my question is, is essentially what I advertised in the, in the abstract. Um, and it has to do with looking forward. I'm going to ask you, do you, do you foresee uh, taking into account um, that we've, done, we, we've seen a lot of uh, kind of excellent things, excellent results being done by some kind of more or less complicated curve fitting in the last 10 years. Um, we've seen a kind of uh, leaps and bounds in so areas like machine translation, um, game playing, uh, uh, you know, image recognition, etc. Um, 
and yet all of them come with some kind of caveats and, and costs. Like uh, you want to do reinforcement learning to achieve al AlphaGo type results, then you're going to need Google computational clusters. You're going to need scale, big scale, to learn those uh, models or to train those models, uh, at least as far as I'm aware. So do you see us arriving at a place where we have um, AI agents or AI systems with which we can interact and believe that there is some kind of comprehension of meaning, the meaning, the things that we find meaningful, um, whether it be through language or whether it be through action. Um, and the reason why I, I kind of pose this question is because uh, I'm interested in this in this topic. But to me, it seems like the answers that are kind of present already in the state of the art might have the quality of a kind of Chinese room. That maybe there is some kind of really good uh, imitation of, of meaning in the algorithmic um, systems, but, but maybe like a serial Chinese room, they are basically just um, working at the level of, of the, the training data or, or the training system if it's not data driven. So what do you think? I'm going to just go ask you to go ahead uh, one by one and give, them, give me your opinion. And, and if you have only to shrug your shoulders, then that's, of course, fine too. But Yami? Uh, well, I, th I think the question is a bit ill-posed, as is the of Chinese, course, uh, Chinese room analog. Uh, I think the meaningfulness or meaningfulness or understanding is sort of in the eye of some beholders. Uh, and uh, I, I, I don't think there's like an essential leap from this Chinese room type rote learning to true understanding. It's more of a matter of degree. And also humans seems to be, seem to be very jealous of this understanding that they think they have and nobody else can. Okay. Well, I'd, I'd, I'll go through the others then before I, yeah, without coming back to that. Uh, yeah, so, so maybe also one question would be how much of the human actions and uh, things that we do are actually also imitation based <laughs> as we also do experience, we have experience that we, we, we look, we, we ingest data as well and many things we imitate and then don't do creative new things. Um, so in some sense also not all human actions are free of just being trained to do that. So in that sense, it's maybe not that different. But okay, that was not your question. But I think what what will be the big next step, and I tried to say that in my talk, was that if if such artificial systems would be able to explain themselves in a more natural way, then I guess we have a good step forward into something that we can trust more. I think it's a lot about trust. Um, if we can interact with systems that can support their decisions in a good way, then uh, we can trust them more as, as some kind of collaborator instead of just having a machine that we have to still check. That could be a way forward. Whether this goes into some more real intelligent behavior, I think we are still very far away from that anyway. So we don't have to believe in the system, we only have to have uh, a fluent system, a sufficiently fluent system. I mean, we believe also in other people because they can support their claims and can argue for their uh, actions and for their uh, behavior. So, so if a machine can also do that, uh, mm -hmm. then we can also trust that machine more, I would believe. Um, shall we bring in the, the remote speakers? Rika? Can you hear? Yeah. Okay, yes, managed to unmute <laughs> my, uh, myself. Um, yes, very um, uh, difficult question. I think I would like to go back to what I kind of mentioned uh, briefly in my, um, at the end of my talk, that if the goal really is to um, create um, kind of artificial um, machines which can which have human-like intelligence and language then maybe they also need to acquire language in the same way as humans do 
that it's not enough to train them with a huge corpuses of language input. Uh, that kind of creates, I guess, some kind of um, uh, language-like abilities, but in order to really make these artificial systems to have something like meaning or like understanding, maybe they, but they need to learn the, the language in interaction with humans and, and the real world. Um, uh, but I, I don't know, that's of course very challenging. I don't know whether technology or our knowledge about the human cognition and language um, acquisition is quite there yet that that's possible. But, but I think that's an, one of the fundamental questions we need to be thinking about um, at the moment. Okay. Um, I think that goes sort of directly towards Jorg's position, in my opinion, because, uh, mm. well, learning from textual corpuses and learning from sort of speech and other expression and very different things, but we don't have time for a big debate about it, unfortunately. So I'm going to go to, to Michael next and, and ask you if you have uh, an opinion on, I mean, these gents seem to be saying that it's enough if it can do the job, but will people sort of accept that? This is maybe your area. Um, do, do, will people give their trust? Th uh, this is this is the people already do give their trust to machines in many many areas. So I don't find that particularly interesting. Okay. What I find more interesting is that when our understanding of what insight learning is, and when our understanding of intelligence changes and increases when science progresses and we understand how complicated intelligence actually is, how that might inform us how possibly to change the models that we have on machine learning, would, or like how would those models change. For instance, what I find extremely interesting is the research which goes into the slime mold, like the uh, tiny fungal organism that can congregate with other tiny fungal organisms and then create a macro-organism. And this organism doesn't have nerve cells, but it still has collective understanding of we have gone that way, there's no food there. We have gone that way, there's no food there. Let's try a different route and then they find food there and then they create these networks where the, dis, uh, where the structure of the fungus is as simple as it can be so that the route between the, like the fungal colony and the food source is as short as possible. Even if they have alternative routes, they still retain the shortest route. So not only do they have understanding of where they have been, they have some sort of collective memory system that they don't try to investigate the same spot twice or three times. They economize their energy. And what I'm also interested in is that there seems to be some sort of insight learning in plants as well, and this is an increasing area of cognitive science, cognitive science of plants. For instance, plants uh, know how to protect themselves beforehand when something stressful is about to happen, if it's associated with changes in luminosity or changes in temperature or changes in um, how, how the light is diffracted from other plants around them. This is a highly interesting area of study at the moment, and I find this interesting because plants don't have brains, yet they have capacities for learning uh, the Slime mold doesn't have a brain, yet it has a memory and capacity for learning and to show some rudimentary insight. Uh, also, we have observed similar behavior in uh, other single-celled organisms that they learn to avoid places that might hurt them. So they don't find food from uh, areas where they might get electrocuted and they retain a memory. And it seems to be the case that they can somehow pass these memories in RNA uh, strands to their fellows as well. So what is that? 
from a cognitive science perspective, that's highly interesting. But there, there are no brains involved. So what is involved? So with respect to AI, is this a uh, comment on whether or not the question about meaning is actually meaningful? Uh, I think with respect to AI and our current models of what intelligence is, we might be looking too narrowly from the okay. wrong place or from a single place when we should actually try to take a step back and think about more carefully what intelligence is and what insight and memory actually are. Yeah. As our friend said, um, I guess the question is, is more though about uh, what we need from our AI to um, not just to have it function and do stuff like a slime mold, but to be uh, sort of so something like a collaborative partner in a, in a human context. So that's just, this is maybe a different question. But I'll give the last word to Rita then. Well, thank you so much. As if I could answer anything here, but uh, I, I think I'm. I'm, I think I'm with Rika very much in this. That it's, I feel it's, it's more and more. I think it's really important to to keep in mind how we actually came to to acquire meaning and understanding. I I only think that it's it's. I think language is kind of at the end there, like how we choose to app to to kind of categorize and give abstract names to things, but but it's really about. I'm just thinking that it's going to be difficult to make the AI to to have similar experiences as we had, because that's a really like a like a lifetime of experiences, but probably less than a lifetime would be enough for for rudimentary ways of of discussing and and expressing oneself and arguing. I think many of us, even as adults, we are not that great in arguing our points. So it's it's clearly not a very easy thing to do. One thing I was wondering about which has come about when we have tried to, when we have applied um, uh, sort of machine le learning, well, language technology-based models of language processing to actually use them as models for language processing in the brain is something that, um, that uh, I means some of the kind of work, but you realize that you really want to have models. And it's the same thing for like just modeling visual processing, which is also something which AI kind of there's lots of machine learning approaches there to, to try to understand like machine learning, machine vision and machine and then learn and vision in the brain. People try to equate this. And what is a really trick there is that there's probably very many useful things that you can learn from the brain, how the brain processes things, but which we don't understand, to to how what might be useful to to take into account when designing AI solutions. But one thing is that for that to be useful, uh, it really is often the case that you may have models which kind of work because they work in the kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, natural language processing, something, it, they work. But really when we bring it to the brain as an explanation of, the, of modeling the brain, we want to have a good enough understanding of the computations that are there. And then we have to think of whether they make physiological sense. And that's often a problem in them that then, then it, you kind of are not happy with just explaining away and then not understanding what it might mean. So if we can kind of, if there's a way to somehow bring in more physiological information that helps to use methods which are developed in the, say, um, well, that language technology, for example, and uh, then kind of tune those models such so that they work even better for the brain, then maybe some of those tunings would be useful to bring back to the, to the kind of AI world. It, it's a long process, I'm sure, but I kind of think that there has to be this kind of interaction that at both ends we can understand in real world, in the real brain, and then as a solution, practical solution, we can somehow understand why these things work and what kind of processes they actually reflect. Okay, thank you, Rita. I'm with you. Uh, I believe in this um, this model of uh, physiological veracity uh, as applied to machine learning, but um, this perhaps something we don't have 
I don't know how much capacity is, is uh, required for that to, when studying humans. Mm. Um, that's like uh, science fi fiction stuff. But we have no more time. Um, I promised to be out of here by quarter past, so we're late already. I want to thank you all, give a big round of applause to the speakers. Thank you very much. Uh, we will have more of these events. I hope that they come at a more, more normal time, but who, who knows? Um, but uh, it's going to be at least next year before we run the next one. And uh, Brain Seminar 3 will come perhaps in January 2021. So I look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you. Bye.